So we'll move now to the next lecture. And I mean, and I'm not looking for compliment, even though sometimes people think I would do. I'm not a good lecturer, so I have tricks. I've developed tricks to compensate for it. One of which is to do as many demonstrations as I can. And I can, uh, I can uh, some I develop, some I, I learn from the literature. This one is straight from the literature. It's in Bourne. Uh, you heard about uh, Craig Bourne from, from uh, Kurt. Um, he has a great book that's called Clouds in a Glass of Beer, which is about atmospheric physics and simple ways to um, show it. And I'm going to use one of these demonstrations to demonstrate to you the, the concept of beam attenuation. So we have two Petri dish on this viewograph, and I'm starting in one of them, I'm going to put Maalox. And what do you think it's going to do if I put sufficient amount of it to the light transmitted through the Petri dish in which I put it? What is it going to look like? Black. If I put enough from the side, it doesn't look black at all, does it? But from the top, it looks black. Look at it from the side. It's, it's totally lit. This can remind me of, of what happened to light in ice or in snow. Um, OK? So transmission through a scattering material. Now I'm going to do the same, but with absorption. What do you think is going to happen when I add sufficient absorbing agents? Green, but then I'm going to use other colors too <laughs> to make sure it doesn't look green. So I'll add a few red drops and then a few blue drops. And then we'll mix it again. What do we get? Black. Black. Can you tell the difference between the two? You can't. So beam attenuation is absorption plus scattering, but just by its own measurement, you cannot tell which one caused the beam to be attenuated. Photons were either redirected or they were absorbed. Either way, they didn't make it to the detector. OK? See, this you're not going to forget. The rest of what I'm going to say, I bet you you're going to forget. But this is not going to be forgotten. But I think it's really important that you look at the two. From the side, yeah. So I'm going to take also the opportunity. We have a guest in the room, um, Carter Newell there. He's an oyster grower with a PhD. Uh, and he's interested in scattering because it's part of water quality measurements we do here in the, in the Demiscotta. And he wanted to learn more about it. So if you have a question about how water quality relates to oyster growing, and if you hopefully get the opportunity to taste the oyster from here, which are phenomenal, um, that's the person to thank for it. Uh, OK, so we're going to move on. Beam attenuation coefficient and its spectra. Also known, you'll see it in the literature. People call it beam C or extinction coefficient and with different notation. So going back to Colin's lecture, we use, and we had a rod here a second ago. Here it is. Here it is. I have one. We have light incident. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so let's. Let's see if I can fold it in some way without breaking anything. Uh, I can take it off. Let's take, I can take it off the table. That would be the easiest thing to do at this stage. Ah! Without making too much mess. OK, here it is. You're welcome. So we have an incident light, and we have, and it's collimated. Collimated means light is moving parallel. And it's monochromatic, meaning it's a short uh, bandwidth. 
And it turns out if it's not, Bayer's law does not, uh, does not work if we're dealing with materials where uh, attenuation changes uh, with wavelength. So we're talking monochromatic light and collimated. Now, the interesting thing with collimated is, so the light goes straight and we use lenses to do it. But remember, on the edges, if here there's no light and here there's light, there will be spherical spreading. So we want to measure it within that beam, within this beam. You don't want to measure it on the edge. You don't want edge effects when you're measuring the beam attenuation coefficient. Because then you have to account for spherical spreading, which we don't do. So we look at beam attenuation as the fraction, fractional loss of light per unit distance. Again, this is a repeat of what you saw in Collins' lecture. Changes of flux divide the proportional change of flux equals to the beam attenuation times the distance. We integrate it in time, and we end up with the beam attenuation, which is 1 over the path length. So x is the path length. If we do it in meter, it's going to be in meters. So for a 25 centimeter beam attenuation meter, it's going to be 0 0.25. For the 0 0.1 at you're going to be using for the 10 centimeter path length you're going to be using this afternoon, it's going to be 0 0.1. The log of the ratio of what makes it to the detector and what you started with. Because this is a number less than 1, this natural log will be negative, and there's a negative sign here to ensure that you have a positive beam attenuation. So the light attenuate exponentially, again, this is a repeat from source to detector. And it's due to two processes, the loss of to, due to absorption we just saw, and the loss due to scattering. And then, in reality, we have to deal with a finite detector uh, collecting light. Now, why do, we, why do we have to deal with a finite detector? Because if we made it as you know, small as possible, there'll be no photon making it in. So it's an issue of signal to noise to ensure that we have you know, a measurement that actually is sensitive enough. We need to have a finite detector collecting light. This is one reason. A second reason, and I'll mention it uh, a little bit um, in what's coming, um, turbulence in the water scattered light. And it scattered light a lot like very large particles, because it's Kolmogorov scale type motion. So these are motions with a, a, a diameter of about a centimeter. And when you deal with things that big compared to wavelength, everything is scattered very close in the forward direction. So if you have a very narrow detector, you're going to make measuring fluctuation due to turbulence. T in homogeneities in temperature and salinity in the water, changing the index of refraction, creating these eddies about centimeter size that are going to scatter light. And indeed, there are people, Bagutsky is one of them, who've um, built turbulence meters that are optical, looking at those effects of the turbulence on the scattering near forward. Now, we don't care about it because it does not describe the constituents in the water. We don't want to see the turbulence effect. And so having a finite size detector, not extremely narrow, is good for us because then we're not sensitive to fluctuation in the light scattering due to turbulence. So that's another reason why we want a finite detector, as well as getting a signal. OK, what are the advantages of the big attenuation measurement? In a, and here, a single wavelength. It's well-defined optical quantity for a given acceptance angle. You tell me the acceptance angles, I know exactly what it means. I don't need to correct for it. It's the one measurement we don't have to correct for attenuation along the path. We don't have to correct for scattering. There's no correction needed to do for this instrument. Most other instruments, we hope the ICAM will be different. There isn't additional corrections we need to do with measurements we're doing with other meters. Pathler, path length does matter. So we have to uh, choose a path length that's um, related to the environment we're going to be in. So the list you're going to be using today, this list, is a 5 centimeter path length instrument. And I also have a path length reducer. I can make it as short as 2 centimeter. We have a 10 centimeter over there, single beam transmissometer. The AC9s you've been using are 25 centimeters. So we adjust them to the environment we're in. Now, how does one adjust? You'll see in the literature again, people will say you should be have a path length um, x that times beam c is going to be about 0.1. This is what you'll find if you open van der Holst. And this is true for atmospheric. Uh, so if I have a c of 1, you want to use 
a beam transmitter with a 0.1 scattering meter. If you have a CF10, you'll use a 1 centimeter. This is far too restrictive to what we see in the ocean, and it's based on physics of atmospheric aerosol that scatter almost equally in all directions, many of them. They're, or they're, they have significant scattering in other direction than near forward. For the kind of hydrosol we're working with, this being one is still OK. So we can use a 25 centimeter path length in a four inverse meter beam attenuation. We're still in the single scattering regime, given the acceptance angle we have. It doesn't violate it um, a lot. And there's been Monte Carlo simulation that have um, supported that. So we're still OK, even with a 25 centimeter path length in a four inverse meter regime, given the type of sensors we have. Um, but you don't want to go far beyond that, even though there are people who've used beam attenuation meters in 100 inverse meters with a path length of 10 centimeters. Yes? How, how much room do you have for potentially getting multiple scattering? It, it depends. It depends. Again, it, what it might do, it depends how much it... So it, it depends on the v volume scattering function, basically. If most of the probability is to go near forward still and you're still collected here, it's not going to change much. The moment you're starting, the single one takes you out, then you're going to change your interpretation of the beam attenuation given the VSF of the water. So this is what you're worried the most about, is photons that otherwise would have been collected that now are not collected. Um, and you can do experiments. Well, it's hard to do experiments. But one, if you're in the same kind of water, varying concentration, you can see whether there's significant changes. But there, the order. 10, 20 percent, they're not order, orders of magnitude, which is what the beam attenuation is changing in the environment. So it's, it's not, I haven't seen it as being usual, u, hugely important. Uh, we don't depend on polarization state. It turns out near forward scattering is, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, what? So the, the, the photons that are multiple scattered, but still make it to the detector, don't affect your beam C. The one that will affect the change in beam C as you have multiple scattering are the one that scattered once forward, but then the second time took them outside of your, of your beam. Or vice versa, if the first one went outside and suddenly the second one, the second will not work because it's, it's, not gonna be, it's not in the right direction, but the third one will make it to go, go in. So it can. It, multiple scattering can cause photon that otherwise would have scattered out to maybe make it in, which is highly unlikely. You need three events. Or photons that were scattered once forward make it out of the path link that would be collected. This is where you're going to get changes in BMC. Does this make sense? Ken? Well, I, just, I was looking at once it's scattered, I don't want to see it. So that's why. Yeah, no, the question is what the second scattering does. Because we're, this is, once it's scattered, you don't want to see it. That's a single scattering. Now, the question is, what happens if you have a suspension that's too dense that you're changing your effective beam C? I mean, you're measuring a beam C that's different than what you're going to get with a single scattering regime. So that, that's, the, that's what we're discussing. Uh, so yeah, you don't want to go too high. There's a whole analysis of this with Monte Carlo by Le Marie at 2010, and it's, on your, uh, it's, it's in your materials. Uh, again, no dependent on polarization state, which is, which is good. So if you use a laser, as does the list, or if you use an LED, as long as you stay near forward, it's okay. You don't have to depolarize your beam. Uh, because, again, in a single scattering regime, the near forward light is not affected by, by uh, polarization. And it's the longest commercial instrument we have to measure optical properties, uh, other than radiance, so for IOPs. These are the longest one we have. So there's a long history in the field, a lot of papers. You we, have, we have developed as a, fi uh, as a field intuition to it. So like all IOPs, beam attenuation depends on size and composition. So here is, these are results for me calculation. You'll be able to do exactly the same calculation uh, next week. So what I like to do is look at particle beam attenuation, but normalize it per volume. So if I take just a particle, put it in, run the me theory on it, and then normalize the signal by volume, what you get is a resonance curve. This is for non-absorbing particle. And you can see that there's, for each index of refraction, this varies from 1.2 to 1.02. So this will be phytoplankton-like. 
this will be inorganic um, sand-like particle or um, quartz particles or calcium carbonate will be in this region. And what you see, two things. One is the resonance change in position. It's longer for the same wavelength for the phytoplankton-like particle. And in the amount of scattering you get per, per volume per particle. So an inorganic particle scatters more because it's more different, as you've seen in the lab we started with. It's, it's more different than the water than uh, an organic particle. Yes? So that what? By particle yes, which you can call also particle mass if their density is similar. So I'm, I'm doing it. So it, yeah, so you get this resident curve. Yes, Colin? Totally. No, it's this is not that. This is normalized per mass. So this is I take the same amount of material and just package it in different sizes. So this is the story of what you've seen yesterday with the cloud. You take the same amount of water but you just package it now in droplets of a certain size that resonate with light, you're going to get the most. And if you make out of it very large droplets, suddenly again it's transparent because now you move to this area. Okay, so how you package the material matters. This is what it says. There's certain sizes that resonate with, and it's interestingly enough, for 660 nanometer, the, the, the phytoplankton index of refraction beam attenuation is affected for the most for particle of the order of 10 micron. Phytoplankton are right there. And this is why optics is so useful to study phytoplankton, because they're right in the resonance for scattering and attenuation. Now, if I add an imaginary part of the index of refraction, remember from Colin Stock, the imaginary part is absorption. The effect, and this is for just phytoplankton-like, index of refraction, the effect is mostly on the dissolved side. It just increases the attenuation. But it does not change the scattering response. So this is by adding more absorption. Suddenly, for smaller particles are affecting my absorption and my attenuation significantly. But it doesn't change much this domination by attenuation, by scattering over absorption as you get bigger. Yes. I'm just trying to understand, put it into like micrometers or something. So this is 0.01 micron to 10 millimeter. With, with this being the range of, you know, 1 to 100 micron is here. This bracket's your resonant. So it's microns on the axis. It's micron, yeah, actually, sorry. Yeah, or, uh, yes, it's, it should be micron. It's not size parameter. It's micron. Uh, no, sorry. I take what I said back. This is in terms of, a, of, a, of something called the size parameter, which is pi d over lambda. And so you can use that if you're dealing with a 660 nanometer light, this will be 12 micron. This position here will be a 12 micron. So it's adjusted to the wavelength. So when you work in this space, you, things, you can calculate one curve and then change the wavelength relative to the diameter. What matter is diameter to wavelength. It's the same as a drum. We're talking the same exact physics as a drum. Depending on the frequency and the size of the drum, you're going to get a resonance in specific size. Okay? In acoustics, it's similar. We'll get to size now. The next one is on, it has size on it. So here is particle diameter. This is particle diameter for a wavelength of 660 nanometer for phytoplankton-like index of refraction. And again, here I attenuate by volume. And what we see is that the resonance change position with size for the same wavelength. OK, so the place where I get the most will change from 420 nanometer here to 660 nanometer here. 
And because this varies, say, from a particle, the maximum here is 4 uh, micron. Here we're around maybe 2 micron. That gives us some sensitivity in the spectra of beam attenuation to size. If I have a polydispersion of particle, different wavelength would be more sensitive to more different sizes, and I'll get information on size from the spectrum of the beam attenuation. So now I'm moving to talk about how beam attenuation is sensitive uh, um, to wavelength. Yes? So if you drew a vertical line down at about three microns. Three microns. Okay. We very rarely have a monodispersed population of just five micron particles. No, three micron particles. Theoretically, so, so if you have a polydispersion, you have to convolve this curve with the concentration, the volume concentration in the different, in the different sizes. And volume concentrations tend to be relatively flat, not number concentration. Okay. So, single wavelength beam attenuation uh, and biogeochemistry. It has been found to correlate well with total suspended mass, particulate organic carbon, particulate volume, and even phytoplankton pigments in areas where growth irradiance is relatively stable. There's good agreement between BMC and chlorophyll, and, and on, on the world oceans, you see it, uh, there's many correlation uh, from Morel's lab and others. So these are just examples where you're finding beam attenuation here and particulate volume here as measured by Coulter counter in different parts of the world. This is from a study by Peterson. This is a study from Bishop, where he looked at particular dry weight here and particular organic carbon, and again, draw nice um, relationship. This is a compendium that came out recently by Paul Hill, who will be here in week four, where he puts in, he threw in all the studies he could find in terms of beam C, normalized by beam attenuation, from all these studies for the maximum and here on this, he put the maximum SPM observed in each of these studies. So maximum SPM here, and this is beam attenuation versus SPM. All the studies you could find in the literature, including uh, some we did here. And what you're finding is that, relatively speaking, most studies are between, have a, uh, about a factor of less than two, between point, maybe four and point one, and one here, point four and one in terms of beam attenuation to SPM ratio. 660. And these are studies using different instruments and many different environments. And then you also notice that there is some relationship. When you have a lot of SPM, you tend to have lower value of CP2 SPM. Many of these studies work in bottom boundary layers. In bottom boundary layers, when you have a lot of material, it tends to be big material. Now, if that big material scattered near forward to your detector, a lot of it you don't detect, which will result in an underestimate of CP, and therefore a reduction in SCP to SPM. So you could, you could explain this, even though we don't have the data to do it. We don't have the size distribution for them. But we could potentially d explain these low values by saying this is probably large particles we're dealing with, for which we get less CP for SPM because most of them are large particles when they get suspended. I'm sorry, can you explain again why the large particles would, make, would have that effect? Because if you have more large particle who's scattering you, you collect in your beam attenuation meter, they don't give you as much CP for SPM as a small particle who scatter more outside of it. Okay? So you, they don't count as much as they would, but in mass, you're collecting them. So it's reducing. OK, now we're moving to beam attenuation spectrum. And before you get completely bored by what I'm talking about, I'm going to start a small experiment. It's going to take some time to happen. So what I'm going to do, Quinton saw that I put exactly the same thing in both of these, and it was bentonite. 
And now to one of them, I'm going to add salt. And that salt, it's a... Bentonite is a clay. It's a clay mineral that you can find in a variety of places. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm adding a salt. And this is a, a bipolar salt that will cause it to bind to itself. So it's going to make it. Clays have charges on them. And if you can um, orient them with, with a solution, you can get them to form aggregates. And I want to show you what aggregation can do uh, to those particles. And these are, of, they don't occur the same way or as dramatically, but they occur in, in, in the world. In, in, in rivers, when they come into the ocean and salt starts interacting with the particle within them, you'll get this type of flocculation happening. So I just mixed it. And what I want you to observe is the difference in evolution between these two. And I'm going to show you some results from aggregation experiments. This is exactly what we do in the lab. And the idea is to see what happens. Another effect I've not talked about and I'll get into is what happens as particle aggregate in terms of their optical properties. Because I just told you big particles are not as efficient scatterer as smaller particles, depending on where you are on the resonance. So that has suggested that CP to SPM should not work very well. I didn't mention this. I should have. Given this, this curve, CP to SPM should not work very well. If I have a lot of big particles, I'm hosed. If I have a lot of small ones, I'm hosed in terms of getting a good CP to SPM, a good measure of SPM simply by measuring beam attenuation. Yet, I've just told you, it's not that bad if you look at all the studies done to date. So what gives? And I try to, I'll try to explain it given this. A lot of the large particles we have in the ocean are aggregates send big particles that are dense, don't stay in suspension a lot. They only stay there when there's very, very strong um, uh, storms, and we're not there to measure them, usually. When the storm is too, and if it's too large, your, your tripod will fall, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, OK, so again, particular beam attenuation spectrum, it's a well-defined optical quantity for given acceptance angle, don't need to correct, don't depend on polarization, and available commercially since 94. So, the co first commercial one is the AC meter you guys are using. Looking a little bit at uh, its spectral shape. So generally speaking, beam attenuation have a simple spectral shape. This is from the first studies done with the AC9, Barnard et al. Uh, this is a study uh, that I've contributed to uh, in, in coastal mixing up it off Martha's Vineyard. And this is a study looking at beam attenuation in the world ocean. So about 50, uh, 55. 57,000 miles of, of cruise, and we bin them into uh, bins of a kilometer. And this is all the type of uh, shapes of beam attenuation we find varying in chlorophyll. So this is high chlorophyll, uh, bigger than one. Uh, the yellow is between the chlorophyll between 1 and 0.1, and the blue is less than 0.1. And what you see is a relatively simple shape. There's some variations here near the red, but other than this, it's very simple. Usually a, a, a lambda to the minus gamma curve fits well. So we're going to get back to it. So a power law seemed to fit well beam attenuation. One of the first studies ever published, or maybe it is the first ever published, on, on the spectrum of beam attenuation was published by Ken Voss. And he did a variety of measurement in the Pacific. And what he found is that if you do the ratio of, of beam attenuation minus that of water, at any given wavelength divided by that at 490, you get a relatively simple relationship. So beam attenuation has a very consistent shape. And indeed, if we take all the Tara oceans and fit this curve to it, we're finding that the majority of them have a gamma of about 1, with some variability around it. But it's very, very narrow, relatively speaking, in terms of shape. The corollary to it is that Either CDOM does not contribute a lot to it or contribute uh, a constant fraction to it, and also that the particular size distribution is not changing a lot in the ocean. Things are relatively in the range that we're sensitive to with the beam transmissometer, so in the micron size range, that there's no huge changes in open ocean. And most of this data is open ocean, so you see that it's very tight. Going back to this one, as we said, we filter on size with the beam transmissometer. 
So we have information on it. And I'll try to convince you that indeed this is what we see. But before I do that, I'll talk a little bit about the particle size distribution. Turns out, and if uh, uh, Stavon was here, we would shout Gewalt, but he's not here, so we can do it. Uh, that power law fits generally well number size distribution in the ocean. It doesn't work everywhere, particularly not in coastal environment, but overall, we've seen, and I'll show you data in a second to support it. It's often used to describe oceanic size distribution. This is from uh, Kurt's paper, uh, Kurt's book, and it's from uh, a paper by Darius and, and Kiefer. Again, a, lamb, uh, a number to the minus four distribution. So this suggests n of d, so the number distribution going like diameter to the minus four, from small colloids all the way to microplankton. And this is this factor I'm, I'm putting here, this psi. This is from other measurements, Zanderville and Pack off the Oregon coast and from Kitchen using number, uh, this is particle volume versus particle concentration. And here we have diameter, or again, particle volumes. But all of them suggest a power law is not a very bad description of what we see underneath. And then we go to atmospheric literature. In 1954, there's this result an analytical result based on me theory that if you have this kind of size distribution and this size distribution goes from zero to infinity, no size distribution goes from zero to infinity, but let's assume that, then beam attenuation will have that shape. It will, and, and these particles are not absorbing, so we're dealing only with scattering particle, then we'd expect a power law for beam attenuation. Now that's very powerful because now we have a theory, and not only this, there's a relationship between the spectrum of beam attenuation and the spectrum of the size distribution. They should be increasing together. So, or, and so if it's steeper size distribution, I accept a steeper beam attenuation, and there's a constant difference between them. This is great. We can do a measurement in the ocean and link it to size distribution. So. <laughs> There's place in the ocean where we expect to, have, to see changes in size. And that's the bottom boundary layer. We also expect to deal with relatively simple particles because it's dominated by inorganic particles. So if we go to the bottom boundary layer, because bigger particles settle faster, we'd expect to have both more particle near the bottom, and we'd expect the one near the bottom to be bigger than the one above. That's great, because it tells us that if we have more particles as we go down, beam attenuation should increase. There's just more mass. And also, if the particle PSD flattened, we'd expect gamma to go from being high to being lower as we go down. OK, now the question is, can we see it? These are measurements from um, a bottom boundary layer off Martha's Vineyard, 70 meter. You can see here density. So the bottom boundary layer is this area where density is mixed. And now you can look at beam attenuation within it. You can see that, generally speaking, beam attenuation increases within a mixed physics, physical uh, uh, layer that's mixed physically. That's because these particles settle within, even though um, temperature and salinity can get mixed, settling by these particles is fast enough that it's not a uniform. Here it's more uniform, but it's not a uniform concentration. And then when we look at gamma, if it's indicative of size, we'd expect it to go down as we go near the bottom. It's going down, it's going down, it's going down. So indeed, what we're seeing is that there's a segregation in bottom boundary layers of particles by size and concentration. So this is consistent with beam attenuation spectra giving us information on size for particle. Now, you say, well, but that's not closure. For closure, we want to see actual measurement of particle. So during the same experiment, um, Wilf Gardner has collected data with a rosette from the, from the bottom boundary layer and then ran them through a Coulter encounter. And what we have here is his psi from the Coulter encounter. I took the Coulter encounter data, power, uh, number distribution, fit a power law model, and then here I put the beam attenuation uh, measured in the water in the same time because these are different platforms it was collected with. And here is the optical platform, beam attenuation here, and here this gamma. And indeed, what we see is that when gamma is high, this psi of the size distribution is high. When gamma is low, this is low. So consistent with theory, 
And then we have these outliers just as a hurricane passed. And we might talk about them afterwards, but not immediately. It might have to do with aggregation, but let's skip it for the moment. But there is this relationship. And as more beam attenuation there is, we tend to have bigger particle. Both will tell us that. But the difference is not exactly three, as the theory of volts will suggest. Theory of volts will say this should be this guy minus three. Well, we don't see that. But maybe it's about 2.6 on the high side and 2.2 on the low side. OK? That's, that's what we'll call closure. Both of them decrease monotonically. The theoretical and observed relationship between x and gamma, so this, the xi, this should be xi and gamma, it's about 30%, despite uh, potentially large error bars associated with the way you sample. What I mean by that is when you collect water in a, on, on, to bring to the boat to do the, the uh, Colter counter, you might break a lot of particle. They run through a spigot. If they were aggregate in the water, free. Now you're breaking them as they shear out. They stratify in the water column. So all these things are there, and yet we're finding this relationship. And we find better agreement uh, with modified theory we did, which accounted for finite and for absorbing particle uh, that we published later. Anyway, it supports the use of gamma on, or the beam attenuation spectra to give you some information on size of particles. Here is another use of this, and this is from Colin Rustler. Um, Colin deployed AC9s in the Gulf of Maine, and she monitors with them. Uh, I mean, she has CTDs, so she can monitor what happened through the season, but she also is decomposing them to NAP, to phytoplankton, to CDOM, and she get gamma from her AC9. And you can see that at certain time, gamma changes drastically, dramatically, here between August and September. And what Colin was able to do is show that it is indicative of a change of species composition in the Gulf of Maine uh, during that time. This is a different study where we look at the effect of acceptance angle. So as I told you, different beam attenuation meters have different acceptance angle and different pass lengths. And the acceptance angle basically tells you what contribution can big particle give you. And so if you look at the beam attenuation you'll measure with these three different instruments, in red, it's the least flock, in, uh, which has the smallest acceptance angle. Least B is in the green, and AC9 is in the blue. Again, I'm using the colors we just heard we shouldn't use. Uh, you see that this one is always larger, the least flock, always larger, as it should be, because it's collecting uh, less of this forward scattered light. If I do the ratio between them, um, what you'll find is that, uh, and it's hard to tell here what I'm ratioing, but these are unitless ratios of Ds, that if I take the AC9 divided by the least flock, I get the biggest difference, and it changes with tide, so I cannot correct for how much I'm losing. So the ratio between them is tidally dependent. If I do the AC9 divided by the regular least, I get this, and if I do the two least together, this is what I get, the red value here. And here is the same information just as a, spec, as a frequency spectra. So very large change if I do beam attenuation divided by least, ba uh, beam attenuation of the AC9 divided by least at 660. I'm about, on average, seeing only 60% of what the least flock sees. But sometimes we see the same, and sometimes it's 40%. So this is variable. Therefore, I don't think we can correct for that effect, unless we know how the volume scattering function changes. Yes, Colin?
Just want to let you... Oh, you see it better without it? Just want to show you that we're starting to see the water here cleaning up by aggregation. The engineers know it very well. They add aggregating agents to, to uh, um, sludge pools, whatever, to get the stuff to sink down. So we're starting to see the cleaning of the... Sorry, Colin, I just wanted to... I got all, do you see it? Everybody can see it? Dark behind. You wanted this. This works better. Okay. We'll get. We're getting to those aggregates in a sec. Okay. Here is where we're getting to the aggregates. So one thing, you know, I told you about handling. You're bringing. You're bringing water to the boat. Yes. So CP lambda, and you saw it yesterday, looks something like this. So it goes like lambda to the minus gamma. When we plot it as function of wavelength here, and here is the beam attenuation that we're measuring. We can do it in 9 wavelength or 85 wavelength, depending on what you use. Often, we'll have here log of number distribution versus log of size, and you'll find curve that go like this. And this is and the proportional to d to the minus xi. This. And the relationship I told you is a relationship that Volz published in 54 uh, with respect to aerosol distribution, but it's an analytical relationship and therefore transferable that says that if you're, this distribution goes from 0 to infinity, then these two are related, and xi equals gamma plus 3. Yes, Colin. No. Okay. So now we're dealing with aggregates. These guys that you're seeing formed here. What happened to aggregates when, when strong shear is in the water? They break apart. So what we did is take two lists, put them side by side, because the list gives us information through near forward scattering about size of particle. And to one of them, we fed the same water, the ambient water, but through an impeller pump. It breaks the aggregate. And what we found is when we do that, the size distribution we, observe, we get changes, or the volume scattering changes, because that's what we're inverting. So when both of them are together, measuring the same water, they agree with each other here. But when, they're, when one of them is pumped and the other one is not pumped, the mean particle size changes between the two, and, the volume, and that's because the volume scattering function changes between the two. So this instrument can be very sensitive to aggregates, and if you're careful about handling the particles, you can actually have a measure of the disaggregated population compared to the aggregate population. And that's important because it turns out that stuff that's aggregated always settles faster than stuff that's not. And so if you're interested in how fast the water is going to clear up, you're going to see that the one with aggregation is going to clear up in about 20 minutes, while the other one will take days to clear. So just by aggregating, and in the water, what's aggregating is organic material that's bounding material to each other. And aggregates are much larger. They have a diameter much larger than the wavelength. So the question is, how do the optical properties change? as you package an aggregate, as you make an aggregate. Because if you're taking them outside of the resonance, if you're taking an aggregate and put it in this part of the resonance curve, then it's going to disappear from your optics. Something that was strongly optical scattering suddenly will be here. But that's not what's happening with aggregates. This is what's happening to sand particles. Big sand particles are here compared to uh, the, the micron-sized particle. But aggregates, it's turned out, there's a counter effect. The counter effect is the amount of water, frag water they have inside them. The more water there is in it, the lower is in the index of refraction. You remember these balls I made in the lab? These gel balls of carbohydrate? They are very big, but the index of refraction is very small. And it turns out if you account for it, the resonance is not that different. If you account for it, 
the resonant changes and to, to increasing size. So here everything is normalized, and I'm not going to get into the details. But everything here is this resonance curve with a parameter called rho, which is due to van der Waals, but it allows you to take all the effect into one curve. So van der Waals rho is a non-dimensional number. The physicists love it. Most of you hate it. But it's 2, <laughs> it's two pi uh, diameter over lambda n to the minus 1, index of refraction. And if you plot things relative to rho, everything falls on the same curve. The resonances are right in the same spot. This is for solid particle, which is awesome, because that means all the physics is understood and contained in one simple figure. But it, as the conservation of misery law goes, but now you have to deal with something you really hate, which is a non-dimensional number. Unless you're a physicist, you really hate it. But this takes into account changes of diameter to wavelength ratio and changes of index refraction relative to water. One is water, n is the difference with water. But all of them align. This is for solid particle. Now I take the same thing and I add to it the kink that now I'm going to allow n to change with water fraction for an aggregate. I'm adding water to it so n goes down. And if I do that, Again, all these resonance curve aligned, which means that I'm not losing efficiency of scattering as I'm growing aggregates. So the scattering per volume as I'm growing aggregates or per mass stays relatively constant. Now, don't believe me, but here are results from Wayne Slade dissertation, where we did exactly this kind of aggregation experiment, but in the lab. So what we do is we do exactly this, except in a large tank, and on the bottom of the tank, we have instruments. We have beam attenuation meters. We have a list. We have acoustics instruments. We have backscattering meter. And what we look here, as time, you can see SPM. We, we, and we're pumping SPM every now and then from the depth where our instruments are. So initially, SPM is not changing. Diameter based on the list is increasing. And then I'm losing SPM as stuff is settling at the level of my instrument, which is about 10 centimeter above the bottom in a 40 centimeter tank. This is, beam this is backscattering here, and two beam attenuation. Beam attenuation by the list, beam attenuation by the AC9. Again, no change, and then zoom, things are changing as the SPM. So notice, there's a strong change in average diameter, but no strong change in beam attenuation, even though I'm changing the diameter. If my resonant curve was focused on the micron size particle and the aggregate behaved just like solid particle, I would have lost I would have lost this signal much earlier. Now this so another way to show it is say, okay, let's take the beam attenuation, these beam attenuation of the AC9 and the least, and simply normalize them by mass. Because I'm measuring mass. Almost no change throughout the whole experiment. So the aggregation does not cause loss of efficiency of the beam attenuation meter in its ability to give you an estimate of beam attenuation, of mass, which is awesome. Yes? This is, uh, I, I would call it the phase shift parameter or the van der Waals parameter, but right? I mean, people call it the phase shift parameter because it has to do with the wave that went through the particle versus the wave outside the particle. But it's, it's fully developed in uh, Scattering by Small Particle, Van der Hals book. And I have a copy in the lab if you want to consult with it. Does this make sense to anybody? It is Chinese. Are we talking Hebrew? Sorry. Chinese you would understand, or Hebrew you would not. OK? Basically, the, the bottom line is beam transmissometer can work well in environments in which stuff is the large particle are aggregate of the small particles. You don't lose tremendously, uh, you don't lose your ability to estimate particulate mass. Yes? Well, this is, this, this is the aggregate we made in the lab, these ones. There has to be validation in the field. It has not been done yet. But the fact that in Paul Hill's study, we're seeing relative consistency in many different environments in beam attenuation per mass may suggest that this is one of the way we can explain it. Now, a, a different story. We've collected beam attenuation uh, on the uh, French vessel Tara all around the world. So this is the most global. Uh, 50, 
7,000 mile. This is the system we had. This is an ACS that's down in the front of the boat under the planks. The ACS is taken care of once a week. It's cleaned and the filter is changed. And you have a debubbler here. Uh, it's here and there's a pump and a switch that goes filtered, unfiltered. Filtered, unfiltered for 10 minutes every hour about. And if we're in coastal environment, five minutes every half an hour. So the difference, as I tried to tell you yesterday, is calibration independent as long as the CDOM didn't change while you were drawing. So here are the spectra of beam attenuation. Again, uh, we, we clump them for kilometer beams, kilometer square beams. So this is the actual spectra, high chlorophyll value, medium, low chlorophyll, beam attenuation scattering, beam attenuation scattering. And here are the shapes. And previously in the literature, we had, shaped for, um, we had shapes uh, published for, uh, by, by both uh, Andrew Barner and by um, Marcel Babin for scattering. And you can see those are the shapes you have here, the, the uh, black, the red, and the red here. Uh, the red, no, the red is equivalent to this. The, the black and the, this one, yellow, whatever it is. I'm colorblind. So the black and the yellow are the literature values from before this study. And then what you see is that we're agreeing with them in the waters where there's the strongest chlorophyll in terms of B spectra. And this is the C spectra as chlorophyll falls below one. And these dotted line are these lambda to the minus, lambda to the minus gamma uh, curves. So the take home message is scattering has significant departure from this model, particularly where chlorophyll is high. And the next uh, take home message, and that's important when we come to uh, shapes that we use in inversion of remote sensing. The, most of the um, beam attenuation spectra falls around a slope of 1. So lambda to the minus 1 is a good model for beam attenuation in open ocean. But this is not the case for scattering. For scattering, it's more like 0.75 if I fit a power law model. Now, why is it important? Because if you believe that this is BP. If you believe that the backscattering ratio for particle is spectrally independent, this is also the spectrum of backscattering. And the spectrum of backscattering is some of the information content we have from remote sensing uh, reflectance. And if we use this type of model, which most people use, then we're likely to be biased in our backscattering spectra compared to using some, if we assume again the backscattering ratio to be spectrally independent, to using something like this, at least based on this study. So scattering spectra and attenuation spectra do not look the same. That's the other. They do not look, they will look exactly the same if there was no absorption in the water. But there is absorption, always. So to summarize, beam attenuation is a robust IOP, but it depends on its acceptance angle. It has a long history. If I had to do a single measurement, this is what I'd do. It's the relatively easiest one to interpret. Uh, and that relationship between spectral beam attenuation and particle size distribution is a, a help us track community composition uh, in places where phytoplankton change as well as sediment dynamics in places where uh, we have resuspension and um, settling. This is it. Any questions, comments? And we can light the lights to see the, how much aggregation has occurred. And you can also see that they look different somewhat, the aggregates and the, those in the front. They don't look the same. But we'll let them, when they come down, it's going to be a fluff layer on the bottom. But look how effective. Yes. So the relationship that you showed with uh, scattering and attenuation, yeah. is that only for in that bottom boundary layer? Is there stuff that looks at it when you're in like, surface waters and you have maybe more like, of an organic component? Than so. Very good question. So most studies, the, the initial studies that look at the relationship with PSD were done in places that are easier to work, which is the bottom boundary layer, because we don't have to deal with phytoplankton. It turns out that several studies have now looked at it where phytoplanktons grow and are finding that our changes are consistent in changes in size in phytoplankton. And Colin Russler has done some, but others have looked at it as well. So it's more general than just inorganic sediments. Yes. I could give a, a real-world example about the population. Um, if, if you're a bivalve sitting in benthic boundary layer, 
right at slack high water, you wouldn't expect any particle flux. But about an hour afterwards, when aggregation occurs, you get up two orders of magnitude increase in particle concentration as that stuff hits the bottom. And that's what they eat. That's what they filter. The oyster we love so much. I love so much. But if you shake up the water, you wouldn't expect it to settle there. No. Because settling increases with aggregate size, as you see here. These aggregates are settling much faster. Same material exactly. All we change is the ionic strengths to form the bond. But you could do the same with organic material, just adding organic juices to it. OK, let's take uh, 10 minutes. And uh, unfortunately, we'll have to come back again after lunch so that Kurt has the full time of his lecture.